and you must promise to me, Raymond, upon all the sacraments and oaths that a man of Catholic and of good faith may do and swear, that never, while I shall be in your company, you shall not pain nor force yourself to see me on a Saturday, nor by no manner you shall not inquire that day of me, nor the place where I shall be. Hello, I am the Succubus Scholar and today we shall not so much explore the world of Succubi, but actually debate the identity of one, and in doing so gain a better understanding of what constitutes a succubus, or incubus, that we may better discern them. We shall do this by trying to establish the nature of the legendary Melusine. But before I start, I would like to give my gratitude for all your support and compliments I've received on my deep dive into the four queens of the Succubi. It took a lot of research to give a clearer picture than what most books tend to give, and I am grateful for the chance to spread the findings to a wider audience. After the video on Aisha's Zenonym, I have received a lot of comments, emails and requests on the difference between Lilith and Babylon. Rest assured, I intend to do many more videos covering Lilith, as well as ones going into the arguments for and against Lilith being Babylon. But as stated before, I wish to take a hiatus on the Four Queens and explore other lesser known succubi for a time, before returning to videos on my Patreon. So today we shall look into a well-known myth popular around the 14th and 15th century, that of Melusine. The legend of Melusine grew in popularity during this time, indeed it still is popular to this day, but during this time the tale had captured the imaginations of many, with countless nobles from the fiery Plantagenets to the Lusignan royals, all claiming to be a descendant of this fantastical being. Before going into her nature, I shall give you a rundown of one version of the myth, the most renowned being that by Jean Darras, written as told by ladies conversing while spinning wool. I have taken my account of this from an old English translation compiled by A.K. Donald along with a few other versions I came across. In the age of the Crusades, Alinus, King of Albany, was hunting in the forest one day when he came across a beautiful woman beside a fountain. Her name was Pressine. Utterly captivated, he proposed to her, and she agreed, on the strange condition that he never spy her as she bathed herself or her children. She bore three daughters, triplets, who had been named Melior, Palatine, and, of course, Melusine. At the time of their birth, Elinus's son, Naphus, witnessed them and went to his father. Your wife has made and is delivered of three daughters, the most fair that ever were seen. Come and see them. In his enthusiasm, King Alinus rushed in just as Pressine was washing her newly born triplets. Upon seeing this, Pressine flew into a rage, accusing him of breaking the covenant and departing with her three daughters to the Isle of Avalon, never to be seen again, after which the king would never fully recover from the grief of losing her. As the three daughters matured, Pressine would speak with grief of the land of Albany that she would never again tread upon, at times able to see the lands from the mystical isle. When Melusine asks what has caused her such grief, she learns of her father's breaking of the oath, which sets her into her fury, thinking they are all trapped upon the isle for his misdeeds. With Melusine's insistence, the sisters agree to go forth and seek vengeance. They seize Elinus and imprison him forever within the mountain of Brombolois of Northumberland. When Prasine discovers this, she is enraged rather than pleased, for she still thought of King Elinus fondly. As punishment, she placed a curse upon her three daughters. Melior was imprisoned in a castle until a knight successfully watched a sparrowhawk fly for three days without rest. Palatine was placed as guardian upon the mountain of her father, along with all his treasures. But for Melusine was given the worst curse of all. You, Melusine, that are the oldest and ought to have known better. All this came and was done by your counsel. For well I know the prison that has been given to your father by you, and therefore you shall be the first to be punished. For regardless of the unlawfulness of your father, both you and your sisters were drawn from him, and you would have been out of the hands of the nymphs and the fairies to return never more. So, from henceforth, I give to you the gift that you shall every Saturday be turned into a serpent from the navel downward. 
But if you find any man that will take you as his wife, and that he will promise to you that never on the Saturday shall he see you, nor that shall he declare nor rehearse your fate or deeds to any person, you shall continue your course naturally and live a natural and human woman, and out of your body shall issue a fairy lineage, which shall be great and of high prowess. But if by happenstance of misadventure you should be seen and deceived by your husband, know for certain that you will return to the torment and pain you were in before, and ever shall you abide therein until the time the right highest judge shall hold his judgment. And you shall appear for three days before the fortress or castle which you shall make, and shall name it after your name at every time when it shall have a new lord, and likewise also when a man of your lineage shall come. So with great sorrow were they cursed and banished, Melusine disappearing into the wild forests and thickets where the fae are wont to roam. Some time after this event, Raymond of Poitou was out hunting in the forest with his uncle. Boars make great sport, but they are vicious beasts, and many a noble has died or been grievously injured from their charge. One such beast charged at Raymond. He struck the creature with his sword, but the point broke off and flew into his uncle, mortally wounding him. Raymond, managing to kill the boar, would wander into the forest grief-stricken. Overcome with sorrow, he would lose his way in the thicket until he came upon a fountain where three maidens dallied, known as the Fountain of Thirst. He did not see them until his horse, sensing their unnatural origins, spooked and fled from Raymond. It was then he would take note of them, and was approached by none other than Melusine, seeking a husband who would break her curse. Through her gifts she revealed that she knew him, and knew of the tragedy that had just befallen him. She also promised him that she would bring great prosperity to him and his land if she took her as his wife but on the condition that he should never seek her on a Saturday. Utterly enchanted by her beauty, Raymond readily agreed, despite the strange condition of this arrangement. So it was they became wed, and the kingdom prospered greatly under her mystical influence. However, over time, Raymond began to wonder what his beautiful wife got up to every Saturday. Her beauty was haunting and caught the eyes of many, and the suggestions of his brother caused him to grow distrustful and suspicious to the point that he suspected infidelity on her part. His jealousy and possessiveness getting the better of him, he went to her chambers one Saturday and peeked through the keyhole of her door to see her bathing, and was horrified to see a serpent's tail instead of legs. However, his love of her did not fade despite this discovery. Instead, he was grieved by his own betrayal of her by listening to the venomous words of his brother and breaking the covenant they had made that first day they had met. In grief he banished his brother and awaited the departure of his love. But when she returned to him the next day, clearly ignorant that he had spied on her, he chose to keep silent that they may stay together. However, it would not stay this way. In time tragedy would befall the family. One of their ten sons, Geoffrey, and his band of ten knights would burn down an abbey to discover that his brother, Froymond, had been within and was slain. Geoffrey, grieved, would flee the scene. When news of this reached Raymond, he was overcome with grief and despair. He lashed out at Melusine, calling her a false serpent and blaming her as having worked diabolical satanic magic to bring down the monks and her own son who had sought the path of God. Upon hearing this, Melusine realised that she had been betrayed, that he was aware of her true form, and thus must have seen her on a Saturday, breaking his oath. Learning this, she knew her mother's curse would take effect, and that she would have to depart from her family forevermore. When she relays this to Raymond, his anger instantly fades, and they both weep for what must now occur. In parting, Melusine uses her divination powers and instructs Raymond to forgive her son Geoffrey, and that he shall prove himself noble in the future. The same for her other sons, but for their son Horrible, who was born with three eyes. She instructs that he must slay him, for he shall bring about great misfortune in the future, if he does not. With heavy heart Raymond does this. She also bequeathed him two magic rings before parting. Then, with many a sad farewell, Melusine flies out of the window in serpent form. 
circling Lusingdon three times and making such a cry as to stir all the people there. And so she flew to Lusingdon three times about the fortress, crying so piteously and lamentably, like the voice of a mermaid, whereof they of the fortress and the town were greatly abashed and knew not what to think. For they saw the figure of a serpent and the voice of a woman that came from the serpent. And when she flew about the fortress three times, she landed so suddenly and horribly upon the tower called Potern, bringing over her such thunder and tempest, that it seemed both fortress and town should sink and fall, and therewithin they lost sight of her, and knew not what she had become. Occasionally, she would visit two of her sons, but from here on she is never seen again, to the despair of her husband Raymond. Though those who are descended of her line, particularly the Lottingans, would claim to hear her cry whenever misfortune was to befall them. So, listener, you are likely thinking, this is a wonderful story, but what is it to do with Succubi? By all accounts, she is one of the Fae, not of Lilith's brood. Well, there is the obvious argument that some believe the Fae folk are, in fact, demons, something that came during the rise of the Reformed Christian Church. Even the friendly fairies of legend were suddenly wicked and devious creatures of the devil. But this is not something I hold to. Fae, from what I've researched, mainly descend from the legendary race of the Dwarfidi Danan, remnants of a people no finding out and inspiration for the elves in Tolkien's work. But not all people agreed that this entity was of the Fae. There were those, such as Paracelsus, who saw Melusine as one of the elementals, or Luther, who did indeed see Melusine as a succubus. The Lutherian Church has had an enormous impact on history, but it's not something I will go too deeply into here. I bring Martin Luther up as when it comes to Melusine being a succubus, it is this excerpt that comes up time and again to state as such. Dr. Luther said he had heard from the Elector of Saxony, John Frederick, that a powerful family in Germany was descended from the devil, the founder having been born of a succubus, just as Melusine of Lüsselburg was one such succubus or devil. He added to this story, a gentleman had a young and beautiful wife who was dying, was buried. Shortly afterwards, this gentleman and one of his servants sleeping in the same chamber. The wife, who was dead, came at night, bent over the bed of the gentleman, as though she were conversing with him, and after a while went away again. The servant, having twice observed this circumstance, asked his master whether he knew that every night a woman clothed in white stood by his bedside. The master replied that he had slept soundly, and had observed nothing of the sort. The next night, he took care to remain awake. The woman came, and he asked her who she was, and what she wanted. She answered that she was his wife. He returned, My wife is dead and buried. She answered, she had died by reason of his sins, but that if he would receive her again, she would return to him in life. He said if it were possible, he should be well content. She told him he must undertake not to swear, as he was wont to do, for that if he ever did so, she would once more die and permanently quit him. He promised this, and the dead woman, returning to seeming life, dwelt with him, ate, drank and slept with him, and had children by him. One day, that he had guests, his wife went to fetch some cakes from an adjoining apartment, and remained a long time absent. The gentleman grew impatient, and broke out into his old oaths. The wife not returning, the gentleman with his friends went to seek her. But she had disappeared. Only the clothes she had worn lay on the floor. She was never seen again. A quick note, nearly all the English editions of this leave the Melusina excerpt out for some reason, so I've had to attempt to translate this poorly from my own broken German. But as you can see here, the whole basis of Melusine and Succubus is based on a brief throwaway comment that Melusine was a succubus or devil before then giving account of a succubus visit that is very similar in composition to the Melusine tale. The tale following is unusual for a succubus tale as it states that originally she was human, the victim's wife in fact who died due to his own sins, perhaps an indirect way of saying he murdered her. Despite her deathly state, she would go on to live with the victim as his wife once again until he broke his oath never to swear profanities. That she is undead suggests more to a white or Balban Sif than succubus, but it is an intriguing take on them. Yet this tale goes against Luther's own statement on Incubi and Succubi, and so. 
So far as Incubi and Succubi are concerned, I do not deny, but believe that the devil may happen to be either a succubus or an incubus. For I have heard many relate their very own experiences. Augustine too declares that he heard the same sort of story from trustworthy people whom he felt compelled to believe. It delights Satan if he can delude us by taking on the appearance of either a young man or of a woman. But that anything can be born from the union of a devil and a human being is simply untrue. Such an assertion is sometimes made about hideous infants that resemble demons very much. I have seen some of these, but I am convinced either that these were deformed but not begotten by the devil, or that they are actual devils with flesh that they have either counterfeited or stolen from somewhere else. If, with God's permission, the devil can take possession of an entire human being and change his disposition, what would be so remarkable about misshaping the body and bringing about the birth of either blind or crippled children? Luther believed that humans and demons copulating cannot bring forth life, and in the tale it clearly states that she brought forth children for him. This also suggests his assertion on Melusine to be untrue, for she and her mother were not human, yet they brought forth children. Martin Luther was raised in a deeply religious medieval environment. There are excerpts claiming that he would argue with the devil long into the night, seeing him as the embodiment of all evil in the world, and would claim to have defeated him many times. Much like the Malleus Maleficarum by Kramer that was popular at the time, Luther took much of his inspiration from the works of St Augustine, who believed that succubi and incubi are one and the same being and cannot reproduce themselves. Instead, they would steal the emissions of mortal men and inject them into women to produce their own offspring. Such was the common view of the succubi during the medieval period, and directly in conflict with the Jewish legends that claim succubi are indeed quite capable of breeding and seek to do so in order to supplant the children of Adam. The reason Christian doctrine disagreed with this and followed St Augustine's belief from his work on the Trinity is that the general consensus was that only those with a spirit can give life, only those gifted with a soul. As stated by St. Thomas Aquinas from his Summae Theologica. Still, if some are occasionally begotten from demons, it is not from the seed of such demons nor from their soon bodies, but from the seed of men taken for the purpose. As when the demon assumes first the form of a woman and afterwards of a man, just as they take the seed of other things for other generating purposes. As Augustine says, so that the person born is not the child of a demon, but of a man. Whilst this does conflict with the older Jewish legends of Lilith, this and Luther's view is a rather nice way of saying we are all of God regardless of how we look when we are born. So in terms of the Christian depiction of the succubus, Melusine does not fit, though she still bears similarities with the Jewish legends of the same entities. If you had been through my other videos, you'll know that there are heavy links with the succubi and sirens, or mermaids as they would later be denoted particularly with legends that both have kingdoms within the sea and both may have originated during the deluge. See my video on Namar. As such, it could be that Melusine, and even the Fey race, may be those left or descended from the antediluvians, hence their strong proclivity for sorcery. If the purpose of the succubus is indeed to breed a superior race, then this too fits with Melusine, giving Raymond many great sons, who would go on to do great things, with the exception of the Freyard Horrible. Another feature of Melusine is that those descended of her can hear her wail in warning of a terrible fate to befall them. This bears similarity to another fairy, the Bean She or Banshee. Those who hear their wails are said to have misfortune befall them. The origins of these creatures are said to be from keeners, professional mourners that nobles used to hire to weep and cry at their funerals, despite not ever knowing them. This ability bears similarities with the affiliation of the succubus to the Screech Owl. A lot of red videos who come from my Celtic listeners. With Lilith often being synonymous to the Owl, though mostly due to debates on translation in the King James Version of the Bible. So far we have it that Melusine could be of the Dwafti Danan or Fey Folk, a mermaid or siren, or a succubus, each will possibly be in the same thing, if not of similar origins. Though there is another argument that I briefly mentioned earlier, that she is an elemental as posited by Paracelsus. Just as man cannot boast that he is God, although he is made after him and exists, thus man lacks that he is not God. And the world people lack the soul, therefore they cannot say that they are men. And so the one lacks God, the other the soul. 
Thus God alone is God and man alone is man. Paracelsus was an alchemist, theologian and philosopher around the same time as Luther and the popularity of the Melusine myth and would play a great role in Melusine as something other than a demon and would even take her as a symbol in his alchemical work. He shared the view that there were other entities in the world other than man but that they were unlike man in that they have no soul. He said there were four types and each had their abode in one of the elements. The sylphs dwell in the air, the salamanders in fire, the pygmies in mountains and nymphs in water. They act and share the same customs as man but are more spirit-like, able to dwell easily in their elements where we would struggle. He saw them not as succubi or demons but equally creations of God in the same way as man, but lesser in their lack of soul. That as we strive to be God, they strive to be as man and attain a soul. Sometimes seeking out our company in the effort to do so. But just as we are susceptible to corruption, so too are they. As he would go on to state for Melusine. We must pay equally great attention to Melusine, for she was not what the theologians considered her, but a nymph. It is true, however, that she was possessed by the evil spirit, of which she would have freed herself if she had stayed with her husband to the end. For such is the devil that he transforms these beings into different shapes, as he also does with the witches, transforming them into cats and wolves and dogs, etc. This happened to her also, for she never was free of witchcraft, but had a part in it. A superstitious belief resulted that on Saturday she had to be a serpent. This was her pledge to the devil for his helping her in getting a man. Otherwise, she was a nymph, with flesh and blood, fertile and well built to have children. She came from the nymphs to the humans on earth and lived there. But then, as superstitious seduces and vexes all beings, she went away from her people in her superstitious belief, to the places where the seduced people come who are bewitched in superstitions and spellbound. Mind you, she remained the same serpent to the end of her life, and God knows how long it lasted. Here, Melusine is one of the elementals who fell prey to the seductions of the devil, partaking in witchcraft for her own ends, and became a serpent as a result. The idea that there are other fantastical entities that are like us and just as susceptible to mortal whims is not a new one. To me, this sounds remarkably similar to the Jinn of Arabian mythology, who in some customs are said to be similar to mortal men but are more spirit-like in their own physical depictions. So perhaps Melusine is an elemental or Jinn of the waters. Certainly all the legends of her share the same depiction of her as being found around a freshwater fountain, bathing in water each week and sporting a tail similar to that of a serpent or fish. Her connection to water is undeniable, as are her supernatural abilities, be they innate or gained from diabolical means. There are other factors supporting the theory that Melusine is a nymph. In medieval romance tales, such as the one by Darius I relayed earlier, nymphs were typically switched with the term fairy instead. But there is another version of the Melusine tale that supports this belief. Darius's tale places Melusine in Poitiers. But you may have noticed earlier that Luther referred to Melusine as Melusina of Lüsselburg, or Luxembourg. That is because there is a similar but different tale regarding the founding of that city. History tends to agree that Luxembourg was founded in 963 AD when Count Siegfried of Ardennes acquired the castle, uh, Lucillenburg, I hope I pronounced that right, as an exchange with St. Maximin's Abbey. From there, the land would develop to become the city it is today. However, there is a legend explaining the Count's motivations for the exchange. Much like in Darius's version, Siegfried was out hunting one day until he became lost in the Alzette Valley, near the rocky cliffs known as the Bock, upon which were the ruins of an old Roman fortification. From these ruins he heard beautiful singing issuing forth. There amongst the rocks he saw Melusina and was instantly enchanted. As the sun rose she disappeared and haunted by the memory of her, Siegfried returned many times in the hope of seeing her again, until, sure enough, he heard that same wondrous melody and the otherworldly beauty seated amidst the ruins. There he proposed to her, to which she agreed on two conditions. She should not be required to leave those cliffs, and never should he seek her on Saturdays. To this Siegfried agreed, and he went to great pains to acquire the bock that she never be required to leave them. During their time together he prospered greatly, thanks to her supernatural skills, 
But like Raymond, he became suspicious of her activities every Saturday, heeding the whispers of his court, fearing infidelity, and so he decided to confront her on that day. He approached her locked door and peeked through the keyhole to see her in her bath combing her splendid hair. But from the waist down, she sported not legs, but a tail akin to a fish. In his shock, he gave a cry of horror. Unlike in Dallas's tale, there is no lengthy and melancholic farewell this time. Realising at once that pact is broken, Melusina, bath and all, sank down into the cliff, lost to the Count forever. Only his youngest son by Melusina would recall a woman in white visiting him in the depths of night to rock him to sleep. But in this version, however, there's still hope for Melusina's freedom. Every seven years she appears, with many centuries having claimed to have encountered her, and issues the challenge. They must appear at the local church at precisely 12 o'clock, no sooner nor later, for 12 days in a row. On the 12th day, she will appear in the form of a fiery serpent with a key in her mouth. The challenger must not fear, and take the key from her mouth and cast it into the river, thus freeing her and restoring the castle to its former glory. Every seven years, the challenger fails thus far, causing a raucous cry to shake the city, and she adds a stitch to her shirt every seven years that ends in failure. Should she complete her shirt before one valiant hero succeeds, the Luxembourg may be lost. To this day, whenever Luxembourg is in peril, it is said those of her lineage can hear her cry mournfully in warning. This version proves interesting not only for its similarities to Dallas's version of the tale, but because to me it further cements her as a nymph or elemental spirit of some form. Such spirits in various versions of their myths are said to be guardians of their domain, bound to the land they are the embodiment of. Here it is clear that Melusina is very much the embodiment of the Bok, a deity or spirit of that land, unwilling or unable to travel from it. Whilst Paracelsus classifies nymphs as water spirits, it is interesting that in this tale Melusina seems to bear the traits of both water and earth elements, her ability to move through the rock as we do the air being a characteristic attributed to the pygmies. Either nymphs are not bound to one element, only to their location, or there are various types of nymphs attributed to each element also. So there we have it, listener. Melusine is either a demonic succubus, a seductive siren or mermaid, one of the fairy folk, or elemental nymphs. Ultimately, it is up to you to do the research and decide for yourself what Melusine is and what she is to you. But fret not, listener. I won't leave you on such a cop-out of a conclusion. As a scholar and observer of succubi, I will give you my opinion. But only if you agree to a covenant with me. That you accepted his my opinion, and that you are all entitled to your own conclusions. But truly, when it comes to it, only Melusine truly knows the answer. Like much of the medieval views on succubi at that time, I do not agree with Lisa's views on these beings, and neither do I believe Melusine to be such an entity. To me she is a nature spirit, one of the nymphs or genius loci of Roman mythology, a guardian of the woods, the springs, the rivers and the rocks. Their kind are bound to the land, but sometimes are encountered by the lone traveller, in the blazing heat of noon or the darkest of nights, be it as an enchanting vision of beauty or as an ever real yet haunting song. Sometimes, like Melusine, Fate presses them to contact the mortal realm directly and find love there. So if you find yourself in the wilderness alone, listener, and hear singing with the trickling of water, know that the spirit of the land has taken note of you. Should you hear wailing from somewhere in the sky, however, consider yourself warned as one of their lineage that disaster may befall you. Thank you for listening. I hope this video was of some use to you. Whilst I may not consider Melusine as one of Lilith's daughters, I found her fascinating and an excellent means of helping to establish the difference between succubi and other entities that are said to share our mysterious world. There are those like Kalutha who are all too quick to label some strange feminine entity as an evil succubus out to cause harm. I wanted this video to try and show that is not always the case and that we should use our own instincts rather than those brainwashed by dogma to try and think beyond the box, as Paracelsus did. I hope to be back soon on another video. Whilst I still intend to cover other legends concerning Lilith and, yes, why I think she and Babylon are separate entities, I still wish to explore other areas first. Right now I'm spoiled for choice. 
I intend to continue the Celtic theme with Blood of Ed and her similarities to Lilith, or perhaps some Oregon. I certainly wish to cover Meridiana and her influence on Pope Sylvester. Or maybe I should tackle the confusing myths around the Queen of Sheba, who some believed was Lilith herself, if not one of her own. If you have any preference, listener, do be sure to comment saying which. If they go overwhelmingly one way, then I shall try to prioritise it. But until then, may Lilith grant you pleasant dreams. <laughs>